Welcome back to day number two of our series on egg health. Excited for you to listen to today as we are digging into diet, one of our favorite topics here, really figuring out how diet impacts egg health so you don't waste time doing the wrong things. So excited for you to listen to today's episode in our series. I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have four spots available per month to work with us. I would like to invite you and your partner to a supercharge your fertility discovery call. And this calls for you if you meet at least one of these criteria. You've been trying to get pregnant for at least two years. You've been through at least one failed IUI or IVF. This calls for action takers. If you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. If you're seriously considering working with us, Go to Fab Fertile, F-A-B Fertile, and click on Book a Free Call. That's Fab Fertile, F-A-B Fertile, and click on Book a Free Call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. There's a lot of information about which supplements are right for fertility. And like most couples I speak with, you are probably taking a lot of supplements. But are these supplements optimizing or harming your fertility? That's why we recommend professional grade supplements without harmful dyes, fillers, or top allergens so that you can prepare your body in the best way for pregnancy. And as you may know, we take a functional approach to fertility. And while supplements are included in your customized protocols, which are based on testing, they are only part of the equation because there's no pill you can take that without supplement the basics such as poor diet, dysregulated sleep, either moving too much or not enough and not dealing with chronic stress. So we do recommend basic supplements for both men and women. And these are essential starters that you need to have right now to optimize your preconception health. And I'm excited to offer you a special discount at our Fab Fertile store. You'll receive 15% discount on our professional grade supplements. So simply go to Fab Fertile store. That's F-A-B Fertile store.com to access the basic supplements so that you can prepare your body for pregnancy success without wasting time and money on supplements that may not be right for you. Go to Fab Fertile Store, that's fabfertilestore.com, and save 15% on your order. Hey there, thanks so much for listening to the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast. And I've got a favor to ask you, if you are enjoying learning about the functional approach to fertility, consider going to iTunes and rating and reviewing the podcast. This is how it helps the show reach more people that are struggling with infertility, knowing that there's another approach that really can get to the bottom of why it's not working in the first place. So all you need to do is if you're on the app or the desktop, just go in and consider leaving a five-star rating and leave a review. And there is step-by-step instructions in the show notes showing you exactly how to do that. So if you can just take a few minutes, just take a few minutes right now, you can pause this, this recording, come back, leave the review. It would really mean the world to me and help others that are on the fertility journey as well. Take care. I didn't need to go to donor eggs. Obviously, mm-hmm. I don't regret it. I have beautiful children. I could have done things differently, restored. I was still cycling back in my in my 20s. I could have looked at my health, the environmental toxins, the stress I was under, Many, many women are being told their eggs are too old. That's often merely an assumption that's not based on actual evidence. The reason being that there is no direct test of egg quality. You can't test egg quality. It's the man who's got a food sensitivity or he has a zinc deficiency. Like there can be a root cause to these symptoms that are, you know, quote unquote, period problems that the doctor will pass you a pill without any question of why. And some part of you knows that if you can reframe your journey from not one of struggle, or if it is struggle, learn how to embrace the struggle. Learn how to embrace it. Most conditions in the child occur during the nine months of development. It's the the genetic switches are turned on or turned off and they're pre-programmed. So you are in such a powerful, amazing position to do amazing things for your kids. You know, why is IVF the first step? Because we believe it should be the last step. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Clark, founder of Fab Fertile and your host. I believe the functional approach is the first step for anyone struggling with infertility, and my aim is to help you get pregnant naturally. 
Today, I'm welcoming Justine Altman back to the podcast, and we're digging into how to optimize diet to improve egg health, day number two of our series on egg health. And today, this episode is for you if you've already changed your diet based on generalized recommendations to improve egg health, but it's still not working. You're not sure which diet will help improve egg health, and you're feeling very confused by all the recommendations. You are ready to optimize your diet to improve your chances of pregnancy success. And thanks so much for listening. I'm so thankful that you're here. Make sure you hit subscribe. And if you know someone else who is on the fertility journey, please share this podcast with them. Welcome back to our series on egg health, day number two. And today we are doing a deep dive into diet, one of our favorite topics. I guess I keep saying that we have a lot of favorite topics on this. We just, we just love talking about all things functional and really how you can help, you know, improve your chances of conception. So excited for you to listen to today. Uh, let's start off with, and hey, Justine, welcome back. Thank you. And today we're going to start off with protein. So protein is essential for egg health and good quality embryos. So let's just talk about protein. I think this one is. It can be controversial depending on if you are, you are eating more plant-based or vegetarian diet. It is to really see is the protein that you're making is the, is it the right amount for you? And we're doing blood chemistry review to see if you're getting adequate amount of protein. So it is encouraging you to have an open mind regarding this and see that the diet you're eating is right for you. So throw that, throw that out as a caveat. A study found that protein represented more than 25% of the diet. Carbohydrates less than 40% had pregnancy rates four times and higher. So let's talk about protein and what we need to aim for. Yeah, you know, so turns out most of us get way too many carbs and not enough fats and proteins, mm -hmm. um, you know, unless it's something we've really put our attention on. And so in general, what I tend to tell people um, when we're getting started is to aim for at least 20 grams of protein at a meal. But even that we find to be a little bit on the low side. And so in general, we want there to be at least 80 grams of protein a day, but it really does depend on, uh, on your, your size, right? So I'm five foot, nothing at all. <laughs> and so my protein needs are going to be less than, than a lot of other people, but it also depends on your activity level, right? So if you are at the gym, lifting weights a couple of times a week that your protein needs might be a little higher than someone else's. But ultimately, we want to make sure that we hit at that minimum 80 grams of protein a day. And for a lot of people, we're looking at more like 100 or more grams of protein a day. If you actually start to track this a little bit and just sort of actually for a couple of days time track, you know, how many grams of protein you're actually getting um, and how many grams of, of carbs you're getting as well, we tend to find that we, unless again, unless we were, were really specific and intentional about what we were eating, we tend to be low in protein and higher in carbohydrates. Um, but it really makes a difference if we start to make that switch, that switch a little bit to more protein and less carbs. Um, and that's because, you know, our proteins are made up of amino acids and amino acids are the building blocks to basically our body making just about everything with the exception of our hormones, which are primarily made from fats and from some vitamins. Um, and so the, the, the proteins and the fats are really important our body tends to like to burn carbohydrates for fuel. It's a quick, easy burn, um, but we're constantly needing more because our body burns through those really quickly. But if we're if we're teaching our body to burn through um, through proteins and fats instead, it's a slower burn. It keeps us satiated longer. It makes us feel full longer. It holds us over longer between meals. We don't get dips in blood sugar quite the same as if we're relying primarily on carbohydrates. Um, and so just getting those, those, uh, those grams of protein in every day are really important. Yeah. And you want to opt for organic and grass fed. And can you just kind of give us a, um, what to look for at each meal? Like the, so the 20 grams, what does that look like as far as like a food? Yeah. So, um, a lot of times for breakfast, if you tolerate eggs, eggs is a fantastic breakfast. Eggs has just like this perfect ratio of fats and proteins and basically zero carbohydrates. And of course, you can always throw in some good veggies in there, right? So if you want to throw in some mixed veggies inside scrambled eggs or in an omelet or something along those lines. And otherwise, you know, it can be any kind of meat, right? So breakfast for me sometimes is a hamburger patty. Um, breakfast is sometimes a little pile of bacon and maybe an avocado. And then at other meals, it's the same thing. So it's basically, it's a some kind of slab of meat. So whether it's a chicken breast or something along those lines, um, or fats occasionally come in different forms. So for me, for a snack, uh, if I'm not able to hit my protein goals at a meal, 
Um, then I'll substitute in the meantime. So my snack will be a package of meat sticks or a meat bar. So something like from a Nick sticks or an Epic bar, we don't want to go mm-hmm. grabbing a, I don't want to name names, but junk food meat bars <laughs> from the convenience store. But, you know, again, something that was, that was grass fed, pasture raised, organic, those kinds of things. But some of those snacks can be helpful um, to sort of supplement. And, and like I said, I tend to do it in between meals. Um, and then a lot of times like breakfast or lunch for me will be a salad where I'm adding whatever less night's leftover protein was. So again, it could be chicken breast. It could be part of a steak. It could be, it could be leftover bacon. Uh, if I'm really in a pinch, then sometimes I'm going for, for deli meat, which is not ideal, but better than junk food. (laughs) Mm. So really basically any, any kind of meat that you're looking for or any kind of protein that you're, that you have an interest in. Um, and then the last thing that I'll mention is, uh, collagen powder or bone broth are also Mm. reasonable sources. Um, it's hard to get a enough protein in a meal from just those sources alone, but they're nice ways to supplement whatever it is you are getting. Yeah. And we prefer a collagen over like many of the the protein powders, as Justine was saying the other day on something where it was literally either they're not the best and they have sort of inflammatory uh, ingredients and uh, top allergens or the ones we do recommend, we've just found people don't like them. So we, so we like the collagen, which basically you put that in your smoothie or wherever it is and it's, it's tasteless and that can, that can give protein as well. So you want to, and really all of this really helps keep your blood, your blood sugar stabilized, insulin balanced, and then controlling your hunger. So, and also if you're on doing the elimination diet, which is free is, does not include eggs, you can substitute in the morning to have like a breakfast hash. So um, like little sausage patties or little lamb patties or beef patties, and then you can just put that with some some veggies. So lots to do. And it's amazing, actually, because sometimes, you know, for years I was doing the muffins and all the carbs in the morning and you'd be like, why am I starving an hour later? Well, there you go, the blood sugar. So to keep you satiated, and it's really important for egg health and your uh, sex hormones. And so the next one we have is fats. And we've done many episodes about healthy fats. And the importance of that is really the building blocks for hormones and really important for egg health. So you want to avoid trans fats, vegetable oils, like soybean, safflower, sunflower, canola oils. As we, I was just saying, fats are the building blocks for hormones. It reduces inflammation and it protects the integrity of the egg. Uh, anything you wanted to say about those, um, those nasty little fats? Yeah. You know, so this is one of those dietary myths, right? We've been told all our lives that saturated fats are bad for us. Uh, and that if fats are solid at room temperature, that they're bad for us. And that the good fats for us are things called vegetable oil, right? And it's, it's a goofy thing. It's like, um, you know, something's not specific. It's like, what are they trying to hide? When we call something vegetable oil, like we should be questioning, what does that vegetable mean really? (laughs) But yeah, so things called vegetable oil, which like you said, Sarah, are the the soybean and the safflower and the sunflower and canola oils. Those oils we know are not good. So they're, they weren't good oils to start with. And then they're, they're processed at high heat, which makes them go rancid. Um, and they're packaged in plastic bottles and plastics have a, a negative impact on our egg health, right? Those are again, all those xenoestrogens that, that affect our hormones in a, in a negative way. Um, it's plastic in, it's packaged in clear plastic bottles, which the, the light gets through. And so oils are very susceptible to, to bright lights. And then it's not packaged quickly enough. And so these things continue to be exposed to, to oxygen for too long and they get oxygenated. And so all of those things contribute to oils going rancid and then them becoming bad fats if they weren't already to begin with. And so if we're looking for good fats, good healthy fats that really help us build our hormones and help us have good egg and sperm health, um, we're looking for fats primarily that came from organic sources that were processed in a way away from heat. That, like, for example, that's what extra virgin means in olive oil. That extra virgin means it wasn't exposed to a whole bunch of heat. It, it didn't use heat in the processing. Instead, it just used pressing right? So they just press the oil out of the olives. We want oils that have been not exposed to heat. We want them that have been cared for by a company that cared about the time that it sat open to the, you know, exposed to the open air. Um, and that it was packaged in a, in a dark glass bottle that has some, some level of protection from the sunlight and from, from, you know, overhead lights, artificial lighting in a grocery store and things like that. Yeah. We're recommending so nuts, seeds, uh, fatty cold water fish, fatty grass fed pastured meat, olives, avocados, avocado oil. And you want to aim for two tablespoons of healthy fat at every meal. And you can, and when you're cooking with fat, you don't want to cook with, there's a lot of questions actually. We're getting this, um, about this in a group that we're running. A lot of questions about olive oil and cooking with it because it can get at a, it can get rancid at a high smoke point. And so, which I think is, 
I don't know if I was seeing it was like at 375, but we don't, we, we don't recommend cooking with it. We recommend you can cook with avocado oil or you can use like cooking with bacon fat. So you can put that into your, uh, sounds kind of gross, but it's good putting it into your veggies. Uh, anything you want to say about olive oil and cooking? Yeah. So it's, that's always what I've been taught uh, in my functional training is that olive oil, it's smoke point is really very low. And mm-hmm. so ultimately that's the thing is it can be warmed but we don't want it to get beyond its smoke point. Its smoke point is when the chemical structure actually changes and it becomes rancid. It becomes a trans fat when before it was a, a good fat. In my line of work, we always recommend that we're that we're using it as a topping. And the same thing with uh, if you're someone who uses butter, butter is the same way that we don't want to be cooking with it, that it's better as a topping. We don't always recommend butter. Butter is a, a dairy product and we see issues with dairy all the time. But mm-hmm. um, but in any event, olive oil is a fantastic oil. It's just one that we we don't recommend because its smoke point is very low. Mm-hmm. And that, exactly. You can still put it on your salads. You can put it on afterwards and it gives it a little bit of moisture. If say your chicken got overcooked, you can put olive oil in, uh, on it after. Or also, I was just talking with the, the chef last night. who with, um, So Caitlin Townsend, I work with a professional chef and she helped design the recipes and the fertility diet challenge. And we were talking about, she was talking about making a pesto. So it was like just taking some like leftover arugula and some uh, greens that you have and some garlic and some lemon and then some olive oil. And then you can pop that on top, on top of your chicken. And then if you have that kind of dried chicken, you, you can add a little pesto to it and it tastes delicious. The next one we have is carbs. And so it's important to look at the right type of carbs. You want to avoid the refined carbs and opt for complex carbs. Our thing is to really look for gluten-free grains, part of the elimination diet. We see a theme with um, women that we work with and couples with, you know, women with low AMH, high FSH, diminished ovarian reserve and premature ovarian insufficiency having like non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So that um, sensitivity to gluten being off the charts and we're doing food sensitivity testing. So really opting for gluten-free grains um, to start with. Anything you wanted to say there on carbs? Or no grains. <laughs> or no grains, exactly. So if you want to rip the bandaid off and just do it, no grains. But that might be too hardcore depending on if you're still doing the standard Western diet, maybe you're ready. But yeah, we we start you with the elimination, then we do the food sensitivity, and then perhaps the AIP diet if it's right for you. Yeah, I definitely, I'm, I'm in the hardcore camp. Um, <laughs> my, my favorite, you know, when we do the elimination diet, um, and we talk about removing things for 10 days and reintroducing things, um, in the back of my mind, I'm going, please don't reintroduce gluten. Please don't. Yeah, reintroduce gluten. don't. <laughs> and it, some people just like to see, right? It's interesting, right? So dairy and gluten top allergens, we, we, we recommend you taking them out for 60 to 90 days. Some, some people like to retest it to just kind of say, oh, wait, okay, well, di- you know, gluten gives me digestive issues, dairy, you know, it does something to my sinuses. So you can either retest it or not, but it's, it still needs to be then taken out. So you still need to say goodbye to it for, for 60 to 90. Yeah. 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 I will, I do have to say, you know, I, um, when, when I have clients who commit right from the beginning to eliminating gluten, they really have tremendous progress as all of our clients do, regardless of, of sort of where we start with the diet. But, um, but inevitably everyone has to test gluten at some point, right? They've got this itch that like, oh, well, just this one time it's, it's my son's birthday and that only happens once a year. And I'm just going to have this tiny piece of cake. And inevitably they learn for themselves why it mattered because they end up paying the price, you know, for another day or two days or three days or whatever it may be. And Sometimes it's digestive issues. Sometimes it's headaches. Sometimes it's a skin breakout. And sometimes it's a weight gain of two or three or four pounds, literally from one piece of cake. And it's mm-hmm. not that you ate three or four, four pounds worth of cake. It's just that it created that much inflammation in the body. In general, uh, you know, so that's 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 me sort of being on my uh, on my soapbox about about gluten. But in general, with grains, um, other grains, non gluten grains, tend to also be in, a lot of them tend to be inflammatory for a lot of people. Um, we tend to see issues with corn quite often, rice to a lesser extent, um, soy definitely we see a lot of issues with. And then in some cases, some of the other grains as well. So things like sorghum or quinoa or um, I'm drawing taff. a blank as to what some of the other, yeah, taff, there we go. But in general, grains tend to be not very nutrient dense, right? And they're, they're all carbohydrates. And so our bodies really need lots of good fats and proteins. And, and, and if you, if you do this little exercise of sort of tracking for a couple of days, how many grams you're getting of fats and proteins and carbohydrates, chances are you'll discover that your proteins are a little bit low and your carbohydrates are a little higher than you want them to be. And so ultimately I encourage you to strive away from grains 
and to focus your carbohydrates on, on veggies and fruits instead, because those grains, not only are they high in carbs and they tend to, um, to keep our blood sugar a little higher than we like it to be, but they're just, they're just sort of nutrient weak. And so we want to be filling our bellies. We, we only have so much space to eat in a day. We want that space to be taken up by things that are really dense in nutrients, whereas grains just are not nearly as nutrient dense as basically just about any of the other things that we could be eating. And let's just talk about why no carbs or keto may not be the answer in, for when you're on the fertility journey. Yeah. You know, so the exact right diet for you, the exact right ratio of macronutrients, the fats and the proteins and the carbs is really unique to you. Um, and it's really unique to your metabolic rate too, right? And so we all have a different metabolic rate based on what the levels of our minerals are looking like right now. And it's different from person to person. And it can be different for the same person from one time in their life to another time in their life. Um, it certainly has changed over for me over the years as I've done quite a lot of different things with my diet. And so ultimately you need to find the diet that's right for you. And what we find is that no carbs tends to not work for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um, it tends to make energy tank. It tends to just basically it's a, it's a, it's a really hard transition, especially if you had a carb heavy diet before and you just wanted to sort of make the switch instantly. And I've done this, you guys have done actually, I've actually done it more than once. I'm one of those, those horrible clients that like, I, I know what I would recommend to a client. And then I completely just do it the, the insane way and don't listen to my own advice sometimes. Um, and I've put myself into what's called the keto flu more than once. And for multiple weeks at a time, we're just like, I can, I'm so groggy, can barely get myself out of bed. I have no energy to exercise, no energy to do hardly anything. I'm struggling through my day. And it's because I made the switch down to virtually zero carb way too fast. And so ultimately, it's really about what is your unique biochemistry doing right now and what does it need right now? And you can absolutely make changes, but it's got to happen in the right amount of time, right? It has to happen at a pace your body likes. And in most cases, when we're trying to get pregnant, our body needs a little bit of carbohydrate, a little bit of excess, excess energy to work with in order to be, for everything to just sort of be humming along at the, at the right level. And like we were talking about, this is all very personalized. So we want to make sure the diet is right for you. Again, the elimination diet. So check that out to start that with you and your partner and, uh, food sensitivity testing. We're having, we're taking out specific foods for 60 to 90 days. Again, you could be intolerant to some of your favorite foods. We've seen that where people have intestinal permeability or leaky gut and you know, your favorite foods, you, your, your body starts mounting an immune response to it. And then as you start to heal the gut, address the gut infections, then you can basically bring back in many of those foods. If it's super high, like if it's a, if it's really high on the food sensitivity test, you may not be able to, but most of them you can probably bring, bring back in. Another thing we see all the time is you're eating that nutrient dense diet. Many people come to me saying they're eating a clean diet and it's quite good, but really are you absorbing those, those nutrients? And especially if you're on birth control, um, hormonal birth control that can then predispose you to uh, nutrient imbalance. And so you're eating that healthy diet, but you're well fed, but malnourished. And so that personalized diet, using testing, figuring out and looking at your blood chemistry uh, review to educate, not to diagnose, and really see what is right for you. Anything you want to say there on leaky gut or intestinal permeability? Because talked about hormonal birth control use, I talked about before about antibiotics and the medications. And the last one we talked about the last one on egg health, we talked about medications with some of the factors that can impact that chronic stress, the processed inflammatory foods, you know, circadian rhythm disruption, the sleep can impact the health of the gut. So all of that where you're eating this healthy diet, but maybe you're not absorbing them. And we see this quite regularly with leaky gut or intestinal permeability. Anything you'd want to say on the leaky gut situation and how that impacts your body's ability to absorb all these wonderful foods you're eating? Yeah. You know, so if we've got some leaky gut going on, which can happen, like you said, for all of these various reasons, then what happens is the body starts to confuse things that are food with things that are not food, things that can have potential to be pathogens. And the immune system sort of starts to go haywire. And when that happens, in order to keep you safe, it airs on the safe side and it starts to sort of attack anything that looks even remotely suspicious. Um, and sometimes that includes a variety of different foods. And that's a lot of times when we develop those food sensitivities, right? So if you're someone who's ever run a food sensitivity panel and you were devastated to get the results back and find out you had, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 things on it, um, it usually suggests it's a very strong suggestion that there's a leaky gut situation going on. 
Um, and it's also what tends to lead to autoimmunity, which, so all of those things, everything is connected to everything else. And as we know, when we've got some autoimmunity, especially like, uh, thyroid autoimmunity, it really has a big impact on our reproductive health. Any final thoughts on diet and egg health? Yeah. You know, just, you know, we're not looking for perfection, right? And so we don't want, we don't want folks to get hung up on, on having zero carbs, on having zero sugar, on never living life, right? Yeah. We want you to still enjoy your life. It's about making whatever upgrades you can um, and sticking to it most of the time. And so the way that I do this um, in my household is we keep really good, really healthy foods in our house, right? So we don't keep grains in the house. We don't keep dairy in the house. Um, there's never gluten in the house. But on occasion, if we go out, we allow ourselves to have a little bit of some of those things sometimes, right? And so in that way, we can always still celebrate events with family. We can always still go out with a friend. We can always still do do the things we need to do to never feel like we're missing out on anything. Um, but but 90% of the time, we're sticking to our diet goals. Mm -hmm. And never cheating on gluten. And never cheating on gluten. That is the one thing. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay. So thank you. And uh, excited for day number three of our series on egg health. And tomorrow, we're talking about the hormone that you may have been told is normal and really what we can do and what's typically missed. And we're talking about some healing opportunities for you to dig into. So we will see you tomorrow. I wanted to share with you a little more about the Fab Fertile Method. So the Fab Fertile Method includes functional lab testing. So we have access to lab testing. We ship it worldwide. We include food sensitivity testing using blood, stool testing, looking at the DNA of your stool, hormone testing, looking at urine over the course of a couple of days, hair tissue mineral analysis testing, so looking at the status of your minerals, and also blood chemistry review, not to diagnose, but to educate. We're looking at your blood chemistry through functional reference ranges. So they're just for, for healthy people, and there's a tighter reference range and place it earlier before it goes to disease. And then all, all part of the method is coaching. So we really include you and your partner. Uh, unless you're single by by choice, then um, the, then you can do this by yourself. But otherwise, it's for you and your partner to help fast track your chances of success. So this will really will help you implement uh, targeted diet and lifestyle changes based on the testing. So at the end of the program, you'll either be happily pregnant, or if you do need to go to the fertility clinic, you'll dramatically improve your chances of success because you've optimized your health. And we specialize in tough cases like low AMH, high FSH, premature ovarian insufficiency or failure, and diminished ovarian reserve. And so addressing the reason for the poor egg quality or poor egg health is a key for pregnancy success. And so it's looking at the whole body and digging deeper. What are those missed healing opportunities? And so there's really no downside to focusing on your health. You'll either get pregnant naturally or you improve your chances of success with IVF with your own eggs. So if you're ready to take a targeted, customized, functional approach, approach with your fertility, book a call by going to fabfertile.com. That's fabfertile.com and click on book a free call. This call is for you and your partner. Space is very limited. We have about four spots available to work with new couples each month. So go to fabfertile.com and click on book on your free call. I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have four spots available per month to work with us. I would like to invite you and your partner to a Supercharge Your Fertility Discovery Call. And this calls for you if you meet at least one of these criteria. You've been trying to get pregnant for at least two years. You've been through at least one failed IUI or IVF. This calls for action takers. If you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. If you're seriously considering working with us, Go to Fab Fertile, F A B Fertile, and click on Book a Free Call. That's Fab Fertile, F A B Fertile, and click on Book a Free Call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. You may be taking supplements that instead of optimizing your fertility, may be harming it. That's why we recommend professional grade supplements without harmful dyes, fillers, or top allergens. Simply go to Fab Fertile Store, that's F A B Fertile Store com to receive a 15% discount on our basic supplement recommendations for preconception health. That's fabfertilestore.com. The Get Pregnant Naturally podcast, including show notes and links, provides information with respect to healthy living, nutrition, lab testing, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without representation or warranties of any kind. 
Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.